The importance of discussing artificial intelligence may very well be crucial to human destiny. Trying to assess everything that could go wrong is not being alarmist. On the contrary, deep thinking, analysis, and advanced planning will allow us to think about what kind of future do we want and ultimately enable us to create a future with AI that is positive for humans and machines. We're fortunate that these conversations are happening more now and that two of the prescient thought leaders driving these conversations are our special guests tonight. First, we will hear from Eric Bren Yaltsen, director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy and author with Andrew McAfee of two best-selling books, The Second Machine Age and Machine Platform Crowd, Harnessing Our Digital Future. Next, we'll hear from Max Tegmark, co-founder of the Future of Life Institute and author of the, new, of the new book just coming out, Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And I understand it's in its second week on the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations. Then the two gentlemen will have a conversation together, and finally there will be time for questions with the audience before we conclude with a reception and a book signing. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Eric Brynjolfsson and Max Tegmark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here. It's uh, a pleasure to be able to have a chance to share some of the research we've been doing and some of the work we've been doing at the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy about artificial intelligence and how it's changing society. I want to add my thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Jack and Susie uh, Reno, for, for supporting this. And thanks to the Museum of Science for inviting me. And especially thanks to uh, Max Tegmark. Um, we were just checking. We, we only know each other about three years, but he's become one of my, my best friends. Um, he is as uh, I say in the back cover of his book, uh, has an absolutely joyful mind. And it's uh, uh, when he said, let's, let's do this, I, I jumped at the opportunity, mainly because it's just fun to talk to him. Is that you're going to find out in a little while. We're going to have a, a really fun conversation where we interact. And I'm also looking forward to hearing all of your questions and comments, because we will open it up and everybody will, will participate in it. You know, we live in some very unusual times right now. Um, as you may have read and seen even, uh, cars are beginning to drive themselves. Uh, people are walking down the street and they're talking to their phones and they're, they're not talking to another person. They're actually expecting the phone to understand what they're saying and talk back to them. You know, it's still a little bumpy. They're not really that good at it, but they're beginning to talk to us. And we're in the, this, I'd say about a 10 year period where we're going from machines mostly not understanding us to machines understanding us pretty well. And that's kind of a, a unique time in human history, and we're all very lucky to be able to participate in that and to be part of it. It opens some amazing possibilities. Uh, these could be the next, the next 10 years could be the best decade in the history of humanity, or it could be one of the worst because the power being unleashed by artificial intelligence is unlike anything we've seen before. So let me first set this stage a little bit by just defining a little bit what we're talking about. So you can think of artificial intelligence as the set of techniques to imitate the human mind. Uh, the classic test for it is the Turing test. Many of you may know that was some proposed by the famous uh, computer scientist Alan Turing. Could you speak to a machine and not know whether or not you were interacting with a human or a machine? Machines aren't really passing that test yet, but they're getting closer and closer, especially in certain narrow areas. Within that is a category called machine learning. And this is really what's driving a lot of the excitement recently, is that good old fashioned AI was an area where we would teach the machines what to do. We would write down symbols and say, this is how you play checkers. This is how you play chess. These are the rules. And this is how you prepare taxes. And the machines would follow those instructions. Now, the machine learning revolution is taking over. Instead of us humans having to tell the machine step by step what to do, which frankly, didn't work that well. It was okay, but it, it ran into a lot of barriers. Now the machines are learning themselves how to solve problems. They're figuring it out. And the way they do that, mostly there's different techniques, but the main approach is that we give them lots of examples. Say, this is a dog, this is a cat. This is a dog, this is a cat. And I won't do it as many times as they do it to the machines. They usually do it 10,000 or a million times. And eventually, 
the machine starts going, oh, ah, I think I see the pattern here. And it will start learning. And the nice thing is we have so much digital data now that we can show them lots and lots of examples of uh, fraud or of successful go moves or of faces that eventually they start learning these patterns statistically. And a particular subcategory of that where really the, the biggest part of the breakthroughs, especially in the past about five to eight years, is in deep learning or deep neural networks, loosely based on the human brain. And let me show you some examples using deep learning, in particular a subcategory called reinforcement learning. Um, these machines can learn new strategies on their own. So one example is the, the group of people at a company called DeepMind, the Google bot, Google DeepMind, and what they did, um, it was on the cover of Nature, the, the science magazine, um, they gave this uh, machine learning algorithm the pixels for Atari games. How many people here have ever played uh, Space Invaders? Anybody here? Okay. How about uh, Breakout? You guys know the game of Breakout? So I'll show you the game of Breakout. They just gave the machine the raw pixels, and they didn't say, this is a paddle, this is a block, this is a ball. The machine had to figure that out, learn it on its own. They gave it the raw pixels, they gave it a controller that, that can move it left or right, and they gave it a score and said, here's the score, look at the score. Your job is to move around the paddle to get as, or to move around the controller. They didn't tell it was a paddle. Your job is to adjust this controller and try to make the score as high as possible. And so at first, the machine wasn't all that good. It would sometimes get lucky and it would hit the ball. Um, other times it would completely miss it. It was basically randomly moving it around but whenever it was successful and hit and got some, the score went higher, the machine was like, oh, I got to do more of that. It was reinforcement learning, getting feedback on what to do more and more. And after about 300 games, it was really pretty good. It was almost never missing, as good as a good teenager, and uh, playing along there pretty successfully. They decided, let's just keep it, let it running for a while. And the guys at uh, Google DeepMind, they don't play breakout a lot, and they didn't know that there was this strategy here. Look at what it does. It figured out how to send the ball around behind. <laughs> And they're like, whoa, we didn't know you could do that. <laughs> so the machine had not only learned how to play, but learned how to play better than its designers. Imagine a, a newborn baby being born and, uh, in the hospital, and you hand it a, a game, and by the end of the day, it's beating all the surgeons and doctors at the game. That's kind of how fast it's learning. Now that's sort of a cool little example, you know, scientific progress. Um, and by the way, the same technique worked for a whole set of Atari games. It did work on Space Invaders and it worked eventually on Pac-Man and other games. It didn't work on all of them, but once it had this quick feedback loop where if you did something, the score would change quickly, it was able to learn those on its own pretty quickly with, with no control programming. Now you can use these same techniques for other things though, not just games. You could think of a data center where Google has all their computers um, running as a big video game. There's all this data coming in and um, temperatures, and the score is try to make it as efficient as possible. Let's lower the cooling bill as much as possible. And your controller is you can adjust the little valves. You can move them left and right. Now, they had a bunch of smart PhDs working on optimizing this, so they thought they pretty much had it running as efficiently as possible. But once they put the uh, machine learning algorithm against it, it got dramatically better. So here you see, this is before the uh, machine learning algorithm was on. They turned machine learning on, and it got about 40% more efficient. And it was improving. And then they turned it off again, and it went back to the way it was before. So the machine had figured out how to run their data center better than all these geniuses at Google were running it. And you, it doesn't take much imagination to say, hey, let's not just do that for that one data center. Why don't we do it for all the data centers? In fact. Why don't we do it for all kinds of factories? We could do it for steel finishing lines and for uh, ma makers of any kind of, uh, of, of an object. So there's room to, to apply these things to improve all sorts of categories. In fact, there's three big breakthroughs where machine learning has made a big difference that weren't important as recently as about 10 or 15 years ago. And we write about them, Andrew McAfee and I do in our book to some extent. Uh, vision and language, interacting with the physical world and problem solving. So for instance, uh, you may want to get some snacks afterwards. Be careful what you're reaching for. Um, there are some muffins here. Not all of them are muffins, though. Um, sometimes we can make mistakes when we're uh, seeing things. And um, 
Fei Fei Li at Stanford has developed a very large database called ImageNet with 14 million images, and each of them has been painstakingly labeled by humans as to what they are. And um, back in 2010, when they tried to have machines see what they were, the machines were not very good. They were wrong about 30% of the time. Today, they're wrong about 2.6% of the time, so they've gotten dramatically better. The steep curve was when they started using these new deep neural net machine learning algorithms. As a reference point, humans are about 5%. They haven't improved a whole lot over that time period. So we still have pretty much the same hardware and software. Um, and so the machines have crossed that threshold. It's an important in inflection point because what that means is that now many tasks that used to be better to have humans do them, well, it's better to have a machine do them, or at least uh, more accurate to have a machine do them. Um, and that shows up in a number of areas. For instance, you can use them to help diagnose diseases. You use that same kind of an algorithm, and you can show it examples of uh, patients that don't have cancer and patients that do have cancer, and the machine starts figuring out as well or better than a human pathologist. There was a paper just published by Sebastian Thrun and Company looking at uh, skin cancer, and it did better than the human. So this is just happening this past few months, past few years. Uh, I mentioned uh, voice recognition. You can see the progress there, 8.5% error rate to 4.9% error rate. That is just in the past year. That's not like over the past 10 years. That's just the past year since July 16th, July of uh, 2016. Still, humans are about 5% error rate too, so you know, it's sort of in that ballpark right now, not quite better than humans. Um, and that is opening up a lot of economic possibilities. Interacting with the physical world, so once you can see and recognize things, for instance, you can recognize a pedestrian or a bicyclist, um, it starts becoming feasible to give control of the car to a machine. Um, when they first started doing these, they made errors about one per 30 frames, that's about once per second, really not what you'd want to have in a car. <laughs> now it's once per 30 million frames, so that's uh, years it could go without making a mistake. Again, better than human. and so. Very soon, we'll see more and more of these in the road. I had the privilege of, I've ridden in a bunch of them now, and I feel quite comfortable uh, driving down the road, ha being driven down the road, making a left turn through traffic, waiting, and uh, ultimately, I think it'll be much safer. There are 30,000 deaths by humans, drivers today. We could drop that by 90 or 99 percent when uh, machines, probably not 100 percent, so we'll have to face some ethical issues when machine uh, drivers still make mistakes, but it'll be dramatically safer than what we have today. Um, and they're beginning to work in factories. Rod Brooks, who used to be at the computer science and AI lab, or run the AI lab at MIT, now has a company over in Boston uh, called Rethink Robotics. Baxter works for about $4 an hour uh, doing simple tasks. You don't have to do any computer programming. You show Baxter what you want it to do, pick this up, put it in the box, and after a couple of examples, it says, oh, I get what you want to do. And it does that task. And of course, Baxter can work seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. I was just on Thursday watching another robot a little bit like this, sorting things, different kinds of soft objects like uh, clothing, uh, faster than humans did. And that will replace a great deal of work in those areas. And last but not least, all sorts of problem solving. Medical diagnosis I already showed in the legal area. I was talking to the guys at JP Morgan down in New York, and they see a lot of uh, relatively routine legal work. What do they say here? 360,000 hours uh, worth of legal work. So what does this mean for the economy? Let me briefly touch on that before I hand it over to, uh, to Max. Um, first off, there's, there's good news, but there's also some big challenges. Um, it makes the pie bigger. But there's no law, there's no economic guarantee that everyone's going to benefit. It's possible for some people to be, get none of their share or even to be made worse off than they were before. And sadly, that's part of what's been happening the past decade. And we, I think it could get a lot worse if we're not careful. Um, productivity has continued to grow and GDP is actually at a new all-time high. But the median family income is lower now than it was in the 1990s. Good news is actually they just had reports out for 2016 in the last year. It, there was an uptick over 3% in last year. Um, and depending on how you do the adjustments, it may have matched the previous high. Although if you um, normalize it, it's still lower than the, than the previous high back in 1997. So we're sort of roughly flat during that period. 
Now median, how can median be so much lower than the per person? And that's because median, you guys at the Museum of Science here, is the 50th percentile. It's not the average, it's a person right in the middle. Half the people are higher and half the people are lower. So the median can stay flat if you have a whole bunch of wealth going to the top 1% or the top one-tenth of 1%. And that's basically what's happened as computers have kicked in. There's been biased technical change. Um, and you've heard about the 1%. The 1% have their own 1%, the 0.01% up here. And uh, the share of, of income going to them is at a new record high. The only time it was close was back right before the Great Depression, if that's any consolation. Um, so um, we are having a, a, an economic challenge of a pie getting bigger, wondrous things happening, but the distribution is becoming more and more skewed. And there are many reasons for that. Part of it has to do with tax policy. Part of it has to do with international trade. But most economists, including me, see the way that technology is being used as the number one driver of that. Now, that's not inevitable. Um, ultimately, we have a, an opportunity to rethink how we organize our economy. We're, if the pie is getting bigger, if we're creating more wealth, that means it's theory for everyone to get richer at the same time. We can make the rich richer, the middle class richer, the poor richer. We can all be better off at the same time. That mathematically adds up. But there's some choices we're going to have to make as a society of what we want to do in terms of, of um, taking advantage of some of this bounty. Business as usual is not going to solve the problem. We're doing a number of things at MIT to try to address it. We're trying to understand the drivers of this, uh, do some research on it. We've also organized something called the Inclusive Innovation Challenge. And I invite you to another event, if you don't get tired out by this one, on October 12th at Boston City Hall Plaza. Uh, the governor, Eric Schmidt, a whole bunch of other people are going to be coming to talk about how we can use technology to create shared prosperity for the many and not just for the few. So with that, let me leave, it, um, leave you with a, with a closing thought that uh, these technologies are certainly wondrous, um, but they give us all sorts of opportunities. They can be used for good, they can be used to create vast wealth, but they don't automatically lead to a distribution that makes everyone else better off. So it's very important, I'm glad you guys are all here, because it's very important for all of us to think hard about what we can do to change the kind of society we have towards a, a better one and what we want to do to use these technologies for broadly shared prosperity. So thanks very much. With that, let me turn it over to Max Tegmark. Thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, thank you much, so much, Eric, for your friendship and for your all too kind introduction and for, all, for setting me up so wonderfully here. Let's see if the technology cooperates while I switch over to this. So I'm going to continue a little bit for, further forward in time and talk about what will happen if AI keeps getting even smarter, what it will be like being human in the age of AI and what it should be like. So let's first go far back, though, and look at the big picture. So 13.8 billion years ago, you know, I have to start here since uh, from ultimately a physicist, our universe was very boring with just un almost uniform plasma everywhere and nobody there to even witness it or enjoy it. Gradually, the laws of physics clumped this into galaxies, stars, planets, and so on. And about four billion years ago, the first life appeared here on Earth. That life was pretty dumb, though. I call it life 1.0 because it couldn't learn anything in its lifetime, like these bacteria here. Life 2.0, which is what I call us, however, we can learn. And if we use Eric Brynjolfsson's metaphor of thinking of us as a computer of sorts, then learning corresponds to uploading new software into our minds. If I want to learn Spanish, I can spend a bunch of time studying and uploading the Spanish module, and now I have these new skills. And I can say, hola, buenas noches, que tal? Right? Bacteria can't do that. And it's precisely this ability to learn, to change our own software, which has enabled cultural evolution, which made us the most powerful species on this planet. Life 3.0 would be if you can also design your own hardware. We humans are kind of trying to head in that direction. We're kind of at life 2.1 right now because we can 
get cochlear implant, or it's artificial knees, artificial pacemakers, but we can, <coughs> but true life 3.0 certainly doesn't exist. Artificial intelligence might help us get there though. We heard from Eric that AI is getting smarter. So let's, and we heard from Eric that uh, traditionally artificial intelligence used to work like when it beat Garry Kasparov, the world chess champion, a little over 20 years ago. It used to work by people taking their own intelligence and encoding it into a computer program, which then beat Kasparov simply because it could think faster and remember more than he could. Whereas the recent progress, as we heard from Eric, has really been driven instead by machine learning, where you just you have very simple machines, <coughs> often with simulated neural networks, a little bit inspired by human brains, and you just train them with massive amounts of data. You feed in a bunch of pixels, and out comes this caption. Oh, it's a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. You take the exact same thing, put in this image, and it'll tell you that's a herd of elephants walking across a dra grass field. Uh, <coughs> it gets even more striking if you look at the playing computer games, as we saw in this nice example that, that Eric showed. Now, once a computer can learn to play Atari games, that sh already tells you that there's a lot of room for growth there, because you can also start to think, if you're a robot, for example, of life itself as a game, where you get rewarded for certain things and just try to learn. And in fact, the same company, Google DeepMind, that did this, Cal, just, came out, this. just came out with um, the following result, where they trained little toy robots to see if they could learn to walk. They just gave them points whenever they were able to move forward. But these, this software had, had never seen a video of somebody walking. They didn't know anything about the concept of walking. Okay? They did this in simulation, because it was cheaper than doing it with metal objects that kept falling down. But the idea is the same, and this is what happened. Nobody taught it to do this. It learned by itself. They tried a variety of different ty body types, including some more animal-like. You see, they learned to run, they learned to jump and so on, and they, anything almost can, in, in life where you have a goal can be thought of as a little bit of a game, whether it's playing the stock market or, or, or playing a sport. So where is this all taking us? I like to think of all intellectual tasks as forming a landscape like this, where the height is how hard it is for machines to do. and. Uh, the ocean level being how good machines are at doing it at present. So our chess playing, human chess playing skills have long since been submerged by machines. Our ability to multiply numbers fast even longer ago with pocket calculators and so on. And of course the worst kind of career advice to give to, to our kids is to encourage them to do jobs <laughs> right on the boundary here which are just about to get submerged. But the sea level is rising in this metaphorical landscape because machines keep getting better. And it's fascinating to wonder what's going to happen. Some people think machines will never be able to do all the things we do, but a lot of world-leading computer scientists think that, in fact, machines will soon eventually be able to do everything we can do, maybe in 30 years or so, submerging even the highest peaks here. And then what? We have very interesting choices to make here. And uh, I, I feel that these are choices we should make deliberately after thinking a lot about them. So in that spirit, I founded uh, with a bunch of colleagues, actually, Maya and Lucas, do you want to stand up? The two of the co-founders of the Future of Life Institute are here. And uh, Eric Brynjolfsson is also uh, someone we're very happy to have on our board here. The idea of our organization is simply that to help create an, the best possible future with technology by um, thinking hard in advance of how, what we need to do to get things right. I'm optimistic that we can create a wonderful future with technology as long as you win this race between the growing power of the technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage the technology. But in order to win this race, we need to change strategies, I feel. In the past, we always stayed ahead in this 
wisdom race by learning from mistakes. We invented fire, screwed up a bunch of times, and then we invented the fire extinguisher. We invented the car, messed up a bunch of times, invented the seatbelt and the airbag, and all in all, that was a good strategy. But uh, as technology gets more and more powerful, eventually we reach a threshold where the technology is so powerful that you no longer want to learn from mistakes. You instead want to plan ahead and get things right the first time, because it might be the only time you have. I would argue that nuclear weapons is already in that category, where we don't want to learn from mistakes and have an accidental nuclear war and be like, oopsie, you know, maybe we should have handled that better. And superhuman intelligence is certainly in that category also. So we need to shift from being reactive to being proactive. Some people call that being an alarmist scaremonger. I call it safety engineering. When NASA very systematically thought through everything that could possibly go wrong with the first mission to the moon, they weren't being scaremongers. Precisely what they did there is what ultimately led to the success of the mission. They thought through all the things that could have gone wrong and made sure they didn't. So what, what is my suggestion for what we should do? Let me tell you f uh, four things I think would be good. First of all, I think we should try very hard to make sure that uh, we get an international treaty against lethal autonomous weapons. So the biologists and chemists are very happy that if I ask you what is your first assessment, not bioweapons. And if I ask about chemistry, what does that make you think of? You're probably going to think of new materials rather than chemical weapons. Why is that? Because those scientists came out in force and persuaded the politicians of the world to make an international ban on bioweapons and chemical weapons. We physicists have a more iffy <laughs> scorecard here, right? When you read about Kim Jong-un and Putin and Trump and the nuclear button and so on, you're like, I, we physicists feel pretty responsible for, for this. And the AI researchers of the world today feel very strongly that they want to be like the biologists and the chemists and keep all the wonderful power of AI focused on things like curing cancer and doing all the other wonderful stuff that Eric mentioned, rather than just making, <coughs> making it dramatically cheaper to murder people anonymously. Uh, as a good economist like Eric Brynjolfsson can tell you, if you take something like that, like anonymous murder, and you drive the price almost to zero, the laws of economics are going to us, lead us to a place we don't want to be. So that would be my, number one on my list. Try to keep this focused on, on civilian things. And I think there's, there's real hope for that, actually, because the superpowers have, all have a lot to lose there. Uh, second, I, I think we should, as Eric said, really try our best to ensure that this growing pie that AI can create is used to make everybody better off. And I look forward to talking more with you right after this about what concretely we can do. And third, I think we have to invest in AI safety research. What do I mean by that? There are a lot of nerdy technical problems that we need to solve in order to be able to transform today's buggy and hackable computers into robust AI systems that we can really trust. Raise your hand if your computer has ever crashed on you. Oh boy, that's a lot of hands. <laughs> How would that feel? Not good. Not good. Frustrating, maybe. But frustrating isn't the word you would use if what crashed was the, the, the AI that was controlling the uh, US nuclear arsenal, for example, or other in key infrastructure in the world, right? So it's incredibly important that we, we up our game in, th in terms of AI safety research, making things work. Another key challenge is to m just make sure that the goals that the machines have are really aligned with ours. It doesn't have to be you know, a, t a, a frightening thing to be in the presence of other entities that are smarter than us, because we've all done it. When we were all little, about this big, we were all in the presence of more intelligent entities, our parents, right? And that was fine because their goals were aligned with our goals. But if you tell your future self-driving car to take you to Logan as fast as possible, and you arrive there covered in vomit and chased by police helicopters, and you're like, no, 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 that's not what I asked for. And the car answers, that is exactly what you asked for. Then you've begun to appreciate how hard it is to get machines to understand our goals when they don't have this shared reference frame. And, and just because they understand them doesn't mean they're going to adopt the goals. 
we all know how tough that can be just from trying to get our children to adopt our goals when they full well know what we understand what we want, right? And then to retain our goals also. Like, my kids are much less interested in Legos now than they were when they were little, so we program machines to be nice to us. We don't want them, as they get smarter, to start thinking, being as bored with us as my teenagers are with Legos. There are a lot of challenge, technical challenges there. And, and just to um, summarize why I think we should take seriously the possibility that we might get machines that are smarter than us, and why these, this AI safety research is so important, let me summarize this all in this very, in this very short little video here. Will artificial intelligence ever replace humans? Is a hotly debated question these days. Some people claim computers will eventually gain super intelligence, be able to outperform humans on any task, and destroy humanity. Other people say, don't worry, AI will just be another tool we can use and control, like our current computers. So we've got physicist and AI researcher Max Tegmark back again to share with us the collective takeaways from the recent Asilomar conference on the future of AI that he helped organize. And he's going to help separate AI myths from AI facts. Hello. First off, Max, Machines, including computers, have long been better than us at many tasks, like arithmetic or weaving. But those are often repetitive and mechanical operations. So why shouldn't I believe that there are some things that are simply impossible for machines to do as well as people? Say, making minute physics videos or consoling a friend. Well, we've traditionally thought of intelligence as something mysterious that can only exist in biological organisms, especially humans. But from the perspective of modern physical science, intelligence is simply a particular kind of information processing and reacting, performed by a particular range of of elementary particles moving around, and there's no law of physics that says it's impossible to do that kind of information processing better than humans already do. It's not a stretch to say that earthworms process information better than rocks, and humans better than earthworms, and in many areas, machines are already better than humans. This suggests that we've likely only seen the tip of the intelligence iceberg, and that we're on track to unlock the full intelligence that's latent in nature and use it to help humanity flourish or flounder. So, how do we keep ourselves on the right side of the flourish or flounder balance? What, if anything, should we really be concerned about with superintelligent AI? Here is what has many top AI researchers concerned. Not machines or computers turning evil, but something more subtle. Superintelligence that simply doesn't share our goals. If a heat-seeking missile is homing in on you, you probably wouldn't think, no need to worry, it's not evil, it's just following its programming. No, what matters to you is what the heat-seeking missile does, and how well it does it. Not what it's feeling, or whether it has feelings at all. The real worry isn't malevolence, but competence. Superintelligent AI is by definition very good at attaining its goals, so the most important thing for us to do is to ensure that its goals are aligned with ours. As an analogy, humans are more intelligent and competent than ants, and if we want to build a hydroelectric dam where there happens to be an ant hill, there may be no malevolence involved, but well, too bad for the ants. Cats and dogs, on the other hand, have done a great job of aligning their goals with the goals of humans. I mean, even though I'm a physicist, I, I can't help think kittens are the cutest particle arrangements in our universe. If we build superintelligence, we'd be better off in the position of cats and dogs than ants. Or better yet, we'll figure out how to ensure that AI adopts our goals rather than the other way around. And when exactly is superintelligence going to arrive? When do we need to start panicking? First of all, Henry, superintelligence doesn't have to be something negative. In fact, if we get it right, AI might become the best thing ever to happen to humanity. Everything I love about civilization is the product of intelligence. So if AI amplifies our collective intelligence enough to solve today's and tomorrow's greatest problems, humanity might flourish like never before. Second, most AI researchers think superintelligence is at least decades away. But the research needed to ensure that it remains beneficial to humanity rather than harmful might also take decades. So we need to start right away. For example, we'll need to figure out how to ensure machines learn the collective goals of humanity, adopt these goals for themselves, and retain the goals as they get ever smarter. And what about when our goals disagree? Should we vote on what the machine's goals should be? Should we do whatever the president wants? Whatever the creator of the superintelligence wants? Let the AI decide? In a very real way, the question of how to live with superintelligence is a question of what sort of future we want to create for humanity, which obviously shouldn't just be left to AI researchers, as caring and, and socially skilled as we are. Thanks, Max. <laughs> so, uh, how do I get involved to make sure we don't end up living in a superintelligence-powered dictatorship? At the future. Well, so on that note, um, I'm very, very interested to continue the conversation with Eric and with the rest of you to hear what kind of future you ultimately, ultimately all want to create with this technology, because that really is not a question that should be left to geeks like myself alone, because it affects us all. 
Thank you so much. Okay. So Max and I are going to start the conversation, and then uh, after, I don't know, 30 minutes or so, we'll ask all of you to, uh, to join in. But let me just pick up. Um, so I, 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 that pen there was asking you a question. Uh, when do you think AGI is going, or artificial general intelligence is going to be here? And you kind of dodged the question, because I know that scientists hate to make predictions about the future. But audiences love it. <laughs> so I'm going to push you a little bit harder. And I know, you know, I was at some of these, both these conferences, and there, we did some polls of, of, of it. So you can be a little more precise about what, what, are, what are some of the people at those conferences saying when we might have machines that are sort of roughly as intelligent. Well, first, maybe you should define what AGI is. I'm not sure we did that. Yeah. And then, and then what, did, what did the other experts say? What, you know, where do you put yourself on that spectrum? Great. So first of all, what do we mean by intelligence? Different people actually quibble a lot about this. So what I mean is simply how good the machine or the thing is at accomplishing its goals. We have machines today that have very narrow intelligence that are better than all of us at multiplying numbers fast, etc. But artificial general intelligence, that's intelligence which is as broad as ours that can get good at any goal. So we asked a bunch of leading AI researchers, when did they, by when did they think that machines would be able to actually outdo us at all goals. And uh, the answer is very interesting. First of all, there was a violent disagreement. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> yeah, which re means we really don't know. Uh, so if, if somebody tells you for sure it's going to happen real soon, they're exaggerating because they're very, very smart AI researchers who think it won't happen for at least 100 years. But if someone tells you for sure it's never going to happen or for sure it's not going to happen in a lifetime, they're exaggerating too because we had a lot of really top AI researchers who, who said they think it's going to happen maybe 2040, 2050, uh, including um, and, and this group of optimists who think that they're going to get there relatively soon, include the Google DeepMind leaders, for example, who, whose work we showcased here. So my, my own feeling is... Um, I think the average was about 2055, but there were two. One 2055 was one... Uh, conference, it was 2047. Just yeah, so not to two be years overly precise about that. <laughs> two <but> years <laughs> later, they thought it was going to come eight years sooner, and so, <laughs> because the progress was, was so quick. So, in the matter, in a matter of decades, I think is a perfectly reasonable um, guess. You know, and we put a lot of thought into our, what's going to happen in decades when we plan for our retirement and things like that. So, even if we're not sure the, that the it is going to happen, the example I heard that was sort of compelling was. Uh, what if someone told you an alien intelligence is going to land on planet Earth in the year 2055? And we, then that would kind of wake us up. And in some ways, this is a, an alien intelligence, a non-human intelligence. Yeah, except we're better off here because if it's just some spaceship that have arrived from the Vega system, you know, we're just going to figure it doesn't matter what we do because their technology is probably so far beyond us. But this is different because we're creating this stuff ourselves. We get the opportunity, if we're careful, to decide what sort of intelligence this is going to be, what sort of goals it's going to have. And I think this is an incredible opportunity we, we should seize and not squander. Well, you convinced one really important person at that, and that was uh, the very charismatic and very successful Elon Musk, uh, who, who came by and uh, he found this to be a really important challenge. He, he famously uh, spoke at MIT and said, you know, uh, we are summoning the demon, and that never goes well, or it doesn't always go well, at least. Um, and uh, tell us the story. It's a really fascinating story in the book, so you have to read the book to get the full details of it. But um, tell us the story about how you got Elon to, to well, to, to make a donation. I won't give away what, what, what all he did, but it was kind of interesting. Yeah, it was, it was a fascinating story. The... Um, yeah. Not too long ago, I, I could never even have dreamt of <laughs> that I would be like doing a project together with Elon Musk. But I started to realize that, that he was thinking very seriously about this. And since we were planning to do this at Mar conference, on the Puerto Rico conference before, where we wanted to bring AI researchers into this conversation, I reached out to him and asked if, if you'd be interested in, uh, in a phone call. And, and it became very clear very quickly that... Uh, not only did he really care about this, but he really gets it. I feel he's much maligned in the media that love to portray him as some sort of doomsayer, scaremonger. I feel nothing could be farther from the truth. I mean, you know him too. He's yep. incredibly 
he has this incredible optimism in the potential of humankind. That's why he's actually betting his energy and his money on, on, on things that, that a lot of other people think are impossible, like going, like spreading life beyond our planet or, or ha making cars all electric and having solar panels throughout, throughout the world. And, and uh, so it's very natural that for someone who really thinks a lot about the longer term future, he's not going to want to dismiss the risk that might ruin everything you know, in 30 years. He wants us to take this really, really seriously. And uh, w what I uh, tried very hard to persuade him of was that um, all you, what we really needed to do was to get the AI community on, engaged in this conversation and show them that, they, that this wasn't about trying to stop AI research. But I talked about winning this race between the power of the research, of the AI and the wisdom. That we didn't need to try to slow down the power, but instead help the other runner in the race develop the wisdom by investing in that kind of research. I talked about various kinds of safety research. And they were all completely unfunded, and, and he very kindly agreed to be the first person ever to actually fund that kind of research. And it was amazing what happened. We, we, after he pled, pledged these $10 million, we... Right, $10 million, dollars, I, that's, a, that's a big number. Yeah, I mean, it's a small number compared to what the U.S. government spends on research, but it was the first ever dollar pretty much spent on, on this kind of research. And we, so we decided to give this out to anyone in the world who had good ideas to support the study. Deadline was short, topic was novel, weren't sure what was going to happen. We got, oh, we got 300 teams applying. Although, although there's a little part of the story that, that's worth it. So he almost... You almost didn't make the announcement that night, right? I mean, that was a little touch and go, uh, as I recall. You were he, so I was at the conference. I was watching you and him. You were kept like going over the corner and having these like <laughs> discussions back when it's like, well, something big is brewing there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, heart palpitations, just right? Remembering. The next, but, but with that night, what, what was the reason why he almost didn't do it? The reason was he was trying to attempt the first ever landing of a first stage rocket booster on this barge. He had and a few his, other things going. And, and he had been, <laughs> you know, this had been a dream of his for so long. And his press people had said, you cannot, cannot, cannot distract the media from, from this, you know, by having another big announcement like the day before. So, so finally we came up with this. This was actually our friend Anthony Aguirre who came, found the magical diplomatic solution, which was he would make the announcement at the conference that he was going to do this. But nobody else would, we weren't allowed to tell the world until right. after the rocket had landed and a right. few days had passed. He swore us all to secrecy. And, and just to make sure that we kept our secret, he didn't tell us the number. So there was nothing really. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> that, that number really is the, is the headline, right? Right. Yeah. But this actually, I feel very happy in hindsight how this helped because it really transformed the way that our AI friend, research friends think about this. Now, they, whenever they go to a conference, they see their colleagues working on AI safety research also and feel, oh, this is cool and that they feel that this is something they can help with, rather than feeling that they're just under attack. Right. So, um, you also mentioned North Korea and um, some of the risks there. Uh, I know that you, you mentioned uh, not just banning lethal autonomous weapons, but you also have a, a project to, to uh, reduce nuclear proliferation. This is not nearly as as uh, distant or hypothetical, it's not 2047, it's like 2017 that we're having, I guess it was today that the, the North Korean sent a missile over uh, Japan again? Yeah. Is there anything, so do you have a, a, a concrete thing that, that we can do about that or anything we should be thinking about? First of all, the, even just uh, bringing it up is a step in the right direction. I, I think this is very much the same phenomena that we're talking about with AI here. You know, we humans through science, understand our world better and better, and we use that to build technology that can amplify our own power more and more. And uh, we have to make sure we have the wisdom to be ready for it. Right? You would never walk into a kindergarten and just give, say, hey, here's a box of hand grenades. Why don't you play with this? Uh, but I, well, sometimes when I listen to statements from Kim Jong-un and I read tweets by a certain uh, person, I feel that that's exactly what, what we physicists have done by saying, hey, take this little box, box of right. 4,000 nukes, you know, and play with them. In hindsight, maybe this could have been handled better. I, I think... Um, How? How could it have been? Today, or even, it can be handled a lot better. If we want to have Russia and the U.S. obviously want to have ironclad deterrence to make sure the other side doesn't nuke them, 
How many nuclear weapons do you need to deter Putin? Well, maybe 100, maybe 500. If you take out the largest 500 Russian cities, there's not that much left, right? Um, if I went down the list of the largest U.S. cities. By the time I got to 900 something, I was in Woburn, Massachusetts, Woburn. So right next to Ryla. Really? Uh, total, or they don't. Russians don't have to take out Woburn to deter us. But we actually, but we don't have 900. <laughs> Putin doesn't have 900. He has 7,000. No offense to those of you from and, Woburn. Yeah. <laughs> anyone from Woburn? Yeah. Why, why does Russia have 7,000? Well, because we have 7,000. Why do we have 7,000? Because Russia does. If Putin and Trump got together and said, okay, let's start by making agreement, cutting it down to a thousand each. Deterrence would be completely unchanged. It would be absolutely, it would not in any way reduce our deterrence against Kim Jong-un either. It would just be a step in the right direction. So I, I think just getting a bit more awareness of, of the risks that our technology poses so, so we can, so we can uh, right. and mitigate these, them and is good. Are just getting, yeah. I mean, as physicists and technologists and Elon Musk and all of you keep inventing more and more powerful technologies. It's like, you know, with a stone or a spear, you can hurt a few people. With, you know, a, a gun or a machine gun or a grenade, you can hurt a few more. A nuclear bomb can kill millions of people, but now the next wave may be literally existential. I mean, one of the things we talk yeah. about the future is, is that there are technologies, not just um, AI, but biological and others that are like uh, not giving a hand grenade, but giving a little red button that says, you know, we'll destroy humanity. Please do not push. And <laughs> right. Suppose we handed out one of those to each person on the planet. Yeah. And, you know, how long do you think we'd survive? Exactly. I mean, I, I bet there were people during the Stone Age also who, for whatever reason, um, thought it was a good idea to kill a bunch of other people during the Stone Age. But they, how many people can you take out with a rock in the club in the middle of the night, right? Not so many. Now that we're, developed, we're, we're amplifying the power of everybody, we have to really, as a society, get together and make sure that this kind of stuff, especially lethal autonomous AI-based weapons, right, don't fall into everybody's hands. And I think that, um, I think that um, this is why we really should st make sure we don't get into an arms ra military arms race with AI weapons, because Whereas nuclear weapons are at least fortunately very expensive to build, these things, you know, we're just going to cost 200 bucks or something, don't cost much more than an Amazon delivery drone, except mm -hmm. it's delivering something else. And if anyone can just program or, in or the... Or it could be cyber, right? Yeah, or but even physical things, if someone can just put in the address and the photo of, of their ex-girlfriend that they're upset about and... and, and, and no, that's a horrible situation we just don't want to be in. Mm -hmm. And I think it, the superpowers are beginning to realize that mass producing this technology is mainly going to help terrorists and non-state actors and weaken China and Russia and the U.S. So that's why I'm hoping they can clamp down on this. It's but in their I, interest. Yeah. But I, so I saw your five-minute warning there, and I, I want to make sure before we turn it over to you and the audience that we get back to higher note <laughs> and not into these mm -hmm. downer topics mm -hmm. like weapons. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask you, Eric, mm -hmm. you spoke very optimistically about how AI has the possibility to really greatly grow the pie. Right. And then you said, though, that there is a, and, and I heard you say before, you know, shame on us if we can't make sure that everybody gets yeah. better off as a result. I'd like to push you a little bit on this and, and ask more specifically, how would you like to see this happen? Because I know in this country, there are a lot of people who are absolutely against any kind of wealth redistribution. Mm -hmm. So, well, should, so let me we do? I think it's worth thinking about sort of the, the shorter term and the longer term. And the, my longer term isn't as long as your long term. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe, you know, the next five to ten years versus, you know, 20, 30 years. In the short run, there's so many things that only humans can do. There's no shortage of work that only humans can do. Most things only humans can do. Wondrous is those examples that Max and I both gave. So we need to think about, okay, how can we, as some of the... Uh, old jobs get automated, how do we, we get people able to do some of the new jobs? And there's three broad things you can do there. The first one that most economists love is, is education, and I do too. And, and there's um, helping people learn new skills, but it's not just m spending more on it, it's more a matter of reinventing it. Um, the kinds of things that machines are bad at are creativity, emotional intelligence, and uh, these are things we, teamwork, leadership, motivating people, these are things we don't teach in schools very well. Um, if anything, a lot of schools seem to be almost designed to stamp creativity out of kids and, and, yep. and adults. And so we want to reinvent how we do school. And it's going to have to be more of a lifelong thing where people just continuously learn new kinds of things. 
you know, technology can help MOOCs, but it's, it's not mainly just throwing technology at either. It's more this, this conceptual change of less memorizing facts, sitting in rows and, and, and learning to follow instructions, which is what machines are very good at, and more how can we play and discover. MIT, we do more and more of what we call action learning, where people are involved in projects and uh, figure out how to solve them. So that would be one part of it. Another leg is um, actually more entrepreneurship. Um, you may be surprised to learn that if you look at uh, entrepreneurship and innovation and job churn in the United States, it's actually gone down. Everyone thinks it's gone up. Technology is advanced, and there's certainly wondrous things happening in Silicon Valley, and we talked about some entrepreneurs. Um, but overall, there's actually been less new business formation, less new jobs created, and less new companies started. And uh, that makes it difficult to invent the new jobs and tasks that are there to replace the old one. It's always a losing strategy to try to freeze the old economy in place. The successful strategy has always been that as technology automates old things, like it did with you know, agriculture and many other things, right. we didn't just say, oh, let's see if we can hang on to those jobs. We, and by we I mean other people, entrepreneurs, um, invented lots of new goods and services. And that's the genius of capitalism. Joseph Schumpeter called it creative destruction. Mm -hmm. And we got to do more to encourage that and make it easier for people to invent those new jobs. There's been more and more uh, regulations and barriers. Here in Boston, there was a, a law passed that uh, a special tax on Uber, that they took the money to give it to taxi drivers to try to like slow down that transition. Um, I was just in Toronto, and they just banned uh, Uber altogether. You know, those are just small examples of, of uh, people feeling uncomfortable with change. Right. And then thirdly, I would, you know, the thing you mentioned uh, is uh, redistribution. We have a, a tax system right now that has actually shifted more money towards richer people over the past 20, 30 years. Even though it's a chart I showed you, most of the wealth, most of the income in the past 20 years has gone to that top 1%. So both the technology and the tax system are conspiring to exacerbate inequality. It doesn't have to be that way. That's a completely a social choice. Um, back in the 50s and 60s, when we had pretty good growth, uh, marginal tax rates went as high as 90%. I wouldn't recommend that, but certainly there's a, a, a it's really a values decision of how we want to, to balance things. And in other countries, like Sweden, where, where you were born, um, they've been very successful in, in Norway in particular, in uh, investing in health, in education, in infrastructure, in childcare, and people having long vacations. So it's not necessarily giving people money, but it's, it's sort of making life a little bit more pleasant, a little less hard-edged. And that's, those, are, those are three things we can do to soften the blow. And let me just say, in the, in the, in the uh -huh. long run, um, we will eventually, I think, I share your um, optimism that machines ultimately will be able to do just about everything that humans can do and do all the work that we do. And a lot of people say, oh my God, the machines are going to take all of the jobs. And, and my reaction that, that, that you mentioned is, is you know, shame on us if we turn that into a bad thing. We're talking about a world with vast wealth and no need to work, and people say that's a bad thing. That should be a great thing, that we are just able to, to spend our time you know, ha having discussions at the Museum of Science and, and playing and, and you know, doing sports and doing all sorts of other things. The problem is the income distribution, and that's a, a social choice. That has nothing right. to do with the technology. But the, just um, to push you a little more yep. on this, so that I, I agree with all of the things you said. They seem like great things to do, and I, mm -hmm. I also agree that uh, if we uh, can have a lifelong vacation in digital Athens, Athens, digital like Athens, that, right? phrase, that could yeah. be great. I mean, some, I, some, of course, we have to think about creating a society where people also feel meaning and purpose. But I know yeah. a lot of people who have never worked a day in their life and feel plenty of meaning, meaning and purpose. Hi there, all children and uh, <laughs> teenagers. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, right. and. Um, <clears throat> So there's, it's, I agree with you, it's certainly doable, but will we be able to actually do it? I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. um, the, um, do you think, though, that we will actually be able to do this? And now the latest tax reform that's being discussed in this country, it seems like it's, again, just going in the opposite direction. Right. Well, I think one, it's one of the reasons that I'm happy we're having this discussion is that it's, it's not a matter of us making predictions. It's, and you said this in your talk, too. It's a matter of us making choices. Because this is, this is totally up to us to decide. And the way it works in a democracy, more or less, is that there's no dictator or king or anything to decide. We, the people, decide. And I've talked to the folks in Congress and even people more senior than that. And they basically say, look, um, you know, I like some of your ideas, but unless 
the citizens, unless the voters are clamoring for it, it's, we can't go out in front of them. We have to listen to what they're saying. So it starts with changing the conversation and deciding, you know, having a deep consideration. What values do we have? What do we want to do? I have no doubt about its feasibility, its economic feasibility. Its political feasibility is, you know, that's, that's a choice that's up yeah. to us ultimately. Uh, is there... Should we take... Uh, yeah. All right. Well, let, let, that's, that's, that's a good note. I mean, yeah. it would be very interesting to hear all your questions and comments. In my understanding, there's a couple of microphones here. Maybe we can bring the lights up. And uh, we'd be delighted to hear uh, what questions. There's one over there I see and one over here. Um, I'd like to hear what kind of questions and comments you all have. Yeah. And since we have a lot of hands, I think, try to keep the questions relatively brief and make sure that they, in fact, are questions. questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. First question right here, over here on this side. Good evening. I'm uh, Anton Spaans. I have a question about the uh, economic consequences of you know, artificial intelligence. Um, basically, machines take over our jobs. Right. Um, so right now, you know, the economic consequences of that, that, that you know, a lot of people will be out of a job. Hundreds of thousands of taxi drivers, millions of you know, truck drivers, and so on, and so on. Right. Uh, you say it's a political choice, but nobody, except maybe us here and, and, and some other spots are talking about it, but on television, you don't hear that. Or in, in the public media, you don't hear those difficult choices. You hear some rumblings about basic income mm -hmm. to solve it, maybe some ownership in, in the data that we give up. What are your ideas of, of forwarding that, that whole right. thing in society that people actually start, start talking about that? Yeah, well, this is a, a huge issue. And I think part of the political dysfunction and anger we have in the economy, not all of it, but part of it, I think, is driven by this economic trends. You know, median income, as I mentioned, is basically stagnant. So half the people have gotten worse off even as the economy is growing. So I don't blame people for being angry. I mean, you'd, you'd be surprised if they weren't angry because they see that they're not, things aren't getting better for them. And so we absolutely have to address it. And I'm quite convinced that over the next decade, um, the, the underlying forces are going to get stronger and stronger. So hundreds of thousands, millions, Tens of millions of people are going to lose their jobs. I have no doubt about it. The question is whether there'll be tens of millions of new jobs um, that come in place, and that is not automatic. So far, actually, we've done a you know okay job at doing uh, of creating those new jobs. They're not as good jobs, and part of that depends on um, you know because just to be clear, unemployment is basically. Uh, higher now than it used to be. Unemployment is not super high. The issue really is more around wages than uh, unemployment. So wages are stagnating, even though the, the total number of people working is, isn't suffering as, as much. Um, can we create new and better jobs? And I, as I said, I think there's lots of work to be done in, in child care, in health care, in elder care, in creative work, in teaching, uh, in science, in arts. Um, and w the pie is getting bigger. We can afford to spend more on that if we want to. The money is also there. So this is, these are some social choices. The other thing is we can enlist the private sector more. I mentioned the Inclusive Innovation Challenge, and there's a 300 company, over 300 companies and organizations that entered, and we're going to announce the winners of some companies that are doing some very creative things to create jobs. But the government can help support that. We just get a little bit nerdy here about it. There, there's something called the Earned Income Tax Credit. Uh, Ro Khanna out in Silicon Valley has proposed to back, radically expand it. It's basically a little bit like the basic income, but it's tied to work. So that if you if you work more, uh, have low income jobs, they'll supplement it, and it basically takes an eight dollar an hour job and turns into a twelve or a fifteen dollar an hour job, not by having a minimum wage, which has the employer pay all of it, but having all of us contribute to it. And that way, the employer has no disincentive to hire the person. The employer hires them just like they did before. The person gets more money. And it gets to Max's question about meaning. A lot of people do feel like they want to be part of the society in a contributing way. And over time, I think people feel more comfortable uh, playing like our kids do. But right now, I think uh, if you just write people checks, a lot of people don't feel satisfied about that. I I've talked to some of my sociologist friends, and they, um, and they feel like um, um, having a way to contribute to society is part of it, too. But I, I, I know there's a lot of other answers. So let me just stop there. There's a lot more we could do. But let's get some other people uh, have a chance. Next question to your left. Thank you uh, oh. both. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you both uh, for being here. Uh, so 
In recent years, many people have taken to the streets in an attempt to uh, solve this problem by asking people to solve it. And every nonviolent revolution has been stymied because the people with their fingers on the buttons also have buttons that they can push to stop that. I see most technological advances in recent years uh, as preventing that. What do you two see as the most seamless, least violent way to overthrow the hierarchical, uh, self-reinforcing nature of the uh, collection of power uh, amongst only a few individuals? Uh, can we use artificial intelligence and the technologies you're talking about for that? Uh, and how would you apply them in this case? I think that's a, a very interesting question. All technology is a double-edged sword, obviously, even fire. And uh, these and modern swords. Not, and swords. <laughs> That's right. You use them to yeah. chop down little trees and yeah. things. And uh, certainly one can use these modern technologies also for positive social change. I feel that what's happening actually is that the, the anger that's being felt by more and more people who see their lives getting materially worse, even, the, even though the pie is, is growing, is very, very real. Uh, and uh, you, you couple that with, a, with major cuts also in, in availability of higher education. So you have a lot of angry people who have not had the opportunity to learn the full details of what's actually happening. That's a dream come true for any demagogues and populists, right? And I think what we've been seeing here in a number of, of recent elections is, is that uh, people are just very hungry for change and they're just going to vote for whoever promises the most change. Barack Obama's slogan was change. And in a sense, Donald Trump's slogan was also change, because a lot of people didn't feel they got enough change from the Obama things. So the Trump and Sanders both promised a lot of change. Brexit was the option that was the biggest change. And uh, ultimately, I think it would be really, really helpful if people can think of clever ways of, of building a social movement that can actually tap into this, these, this anger of people, show people solutions that will actually work. Eric's book. Eric's new book, Machine, Platform, and Crowd, talks precisely about the sort of drivers that businesses have very successfully used to use modern technology to be disruptive. And I would love to see some of these same ideas yeah. to be used to transform our society into uh, yeah. something that functions and better. Let me just add to that very briefly. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of tools available for centralizing power, but at least as many for, for decentralizing power, to giving power to the crowd. That was the, uh, at least a third of our last book, oh, my, the newest book, was, is about um, whether it's social media or lots of other tools for tapping into the millions or billions of brains. We all use Wikipedia and other things. Um, I just want to um, push back on one part of what you said. I'm not sure that the answer is to overthrow what we have right now. Maybe it's because I'm older. But um, uh, I think we we've actually had some institutions that have been incredibly valuable for creating power to the people. And there are countries that have used them more effectively. Um, and we just talked about some of the Scandinavian countries that do that. And if we could restore some of those institutions, that might be helpful. But, but if we don't, I think if, if we fail to uh, live up to the promise of the, what the institutions were originally designed for or hoped for, then I think we will have them overthrown. I don't think the United States is immune to that. And I think the kind of, of revolution that we've seen in many other countries, other times, and even the United States 200 w years ago, could happen here. And so the people who right now are in power should be very aware of that, that if they don't think about ways of creating shared prosperity, um, then people will come after them with the pitchforks like, like this guy's going to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have our next question right up here in the front. Um, I think we can address some of the fears of the um, artificial intelligence like turning against us by looking at the movie War Games. Mm. The only way to win is not to play. And if we look at just very simple game theory, I mean, we know that the, the secret is almost always cooperate and not compete. And any intelligent computer is going to learn that, yeah. right? Yeah. Isn't that? So how, that's a very good question you raised there. How do you make people cooperate rather than f fight? I, I think that one of the most powerful ways to make key people cooperate is to have them all think about a positive shared vision that they have. 
which, you know, why right. do people agree to give up a lot of freedom to get married, for example? Because they, have a, they think about all the cool things that marriage will enable, right? And it's the same for all collaboration. It's because all parties realize that, hey, you know, if I put this little petty thing aside and collaborate, I can do this great stuff. Now, what are we actually doing as a society when we envision the future? Kind of exactly the opposite. Oh, if you go to the movies and look at the visions of the future, they're almost all dystopias. It's the Terminator or, or you name it, right? And my wife, Maya, likes to point out that that's exactly the opposite of what we actually have to do. You know, I ha Eric and I often get students coming into our offices at MIT and asking for career advice, right? And I always ask them, where do you want to be in the future? And if she says, oh, I, in 20 years, I'm gonna have, maybe I'll have cancer, maybe I'll have been uh, stabbed, you know, that's a terrible way to <laughs> plan her future. She should, I want her to have her eyes sparkling and excited and this is where I want to be. And then you can think about challenges and how to avoid them. We as, a, as humankind need to do that too. In fact, that's the key reason why I wrote my book. I wanted to really encourage people to think about what sort of future you're excited about to create with all this technology. And I'm, I'm hoping that this can really foster the kind of collaboration that you're talking about where people say, yeah, if we actually work together, we can get there. That, that just seems like the perfect place to end, actually. Um, working at the idea of cooperation and how can we work together to envision a better or at least a really positive future. So I'm going to take <laughs> the priority here of um, saying that we're going to now invite you to join us to continue this conversation at a reception and a book signing. Um, we'll have desserts. It's in the museum's cafeteria. So you'll have to exit the theater and then turn right and then follow the signs and then ultimately down to the bottom floor. Eric and Max will be there to be talk to um, and hopefully we can all <laughs> we can all we can all talk to one another because there are some really amazing comments and concerns and hopes that were raised here so thank you gentlemen so much this has been um, very eye-opening and amazing uh, thank you <laughs> thank you That's wonderful thank you so much thank you sorry uh, thank you all right That's really fun perfect lots of fun